Hello guys, it's Oris here and regards from uh, British city of York. You, you, you will look on this table, this arrangement, and you will probably think that this is somewhere in Ukraine, but actually we are in Britain and I'm uh, very happy to introduce you uh, Taras Kuzio, a famous political expert with Ukrainian uh, origin. You live in Britain like all your life, basically, as I yes, understand. Yes, yes, yes. And um, I'm very pleased and honored that uh, you invited me, that we arranged this meeting, and I think uh, considering your perspective and considering your background, you worked all your life in different think tanks, different organizations related to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So you have a unique perspective on our country, on my native country, from, from the global world. And since Ukraine is rediscovered by the population of our planet, since the Russian invasion on Ukraine, I would I think it would be nice to examine how the, like the modern history of Ukraine like how it established itself as the sovereign state and then let's talk about the first 30 years that actually lead it to those tragic events that we have now uh, I was uh, I was um, involved um, and I and I headed a Ukrainian um, kind of information office in London from 1985 until 1991 called UPA, yeah. <laughs> Ukraine, Ukrainian Press Agency, <laughs> um, obviously with the pun for UPA. And um, this was funded by American Ukraine organization called Prolog Research Corporation. Um, we, we did, we did um, English language publications um, on Ukraine and we also did Ukraine, uh, English language um, press releases and uh, translated uh, Samvidav, Samizdat from Ukraine. And importantly, we also did smuggling. Okay. I, I was a smuggler uh, in, into Ukraine um, in, the, in the Gorbachev period. So like uh, even during the late Soviet era, you already yes. were this commerçant guy? Uh, no, smuggler from the uh, point of view of, of anti-communist smuggler. Okay, okay. Uh, not, a, not, a, Media not, a, not a business smuggler. Okay, uh, yeah, okay. No, no, a political smuggler. Um, we did a lot of this through Poland, through because because we were cooperating with Polish and underground and solidarity movement. Um, so things like uh, printing, printing equipment, uh, Xerox machines, fax machines, because fax machine arrived in the world in about 1987, mm -hmm. 88. It was revolutionary, like internet was revolution. Fax machine was revolutionary. Um, and also Western emigre books and, and things like this, journals. We printed things in Poland and then sent it to Ukraine. And so that was very, very important. Was the, that organization part of the grand scheme of things in order to you know, help Soviet Union collapse? Of course, of okay, course. So it was like one uh, of the tools. Every, I mean, kind okay. of every emigre group was uh, doing this. Uh, um, uh, Poles were doing this, uh, Lithuanians, Ukrainians, Russians were kind of a bit, bit more complicated mm -hmm. because you, they were divided between uh, extreme Russian nationalists and uh, uh, liberal Democrats who often were Jewish immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, so the Ukrainian one was active uh, since the 1950s, um, and um, the, the, it's not a secret that uh, some of these groups were funded by the Americans um, in the Cold War. Um, and because of my activities, I was uh, uh, attacked in the Soviet Ukrainian um, media right up until 1990. Okay. Um, you were like my age approximately back then. Yes, uh, okay. but, but the typical, you know, it was the typical things which today you also hear from the Russian media that you are a member of a Western intelligence organization, uh -huh. you're a fascist, etc., etc. Yeah. So, you know, um, Putin didn't invent anything new. He just revived this Soviet propaganda against the diasporas. And the thing to remember is that um, Soviet propaganda against all of these diasporas, the biggest and greatest uh, work of the Soviet uh, ideological machine was always against Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. They never attacked Russians in the West because Russians never called for independence for Russia. Okay. And this is very important. Yeah. They never called for independence of Soviet Russia from the USSR. 
So the main threat to the survival of the Soviet Union was Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we saw this in 1991 when Ukraine declared independence and held a referendum on independence. That was the end of the Soviet Union. And it actually makes sense because Ukrainian, Ukraine as a, an entity was like one third of the Soviet Union in many senses. Well, it was, it was economy, yeah. influence. It was uh, many things. It yeah, was that. Yeah. It was also... Um, uh, people tend to not realize this, that the largest communist party in the Soviet Union was Ukrainian uh -huh. because the Russian Republic did not have any institutions. There was no Russian Communist Party in Moscow. There was no Russian Komsomol, Communist Youth Organization, no Russian Academy of Sciences because Russian and Soviet identity was the same. Um, so, but in Kiev, you had, you know, all of these institutions, Academy of Sciences, Dissidents, government, uh, everything. Yeah, yeah. And so the Ukrainian Communist Party was huge. Um, in 1985, it was three and a half million people. Um, and, and so the um, Ukraine was also important in terms of military industrial complex. 40% of the Ukraine's economy was military industrial complex. Uh -huh. In the Soviet Union, uh, the biggest factory in the world uh, which made nuclear weapons was in Ukraine. In Kuchma was the head of it in yeah, Pivdemash in, in, in Russia. Yeah. Yes, in uh, Russia, in Russian it was called Yuzhmash. Fifty thousand people worked there. Fifty thousand. Ukraine was of course um, important, and the irony is that that's the same today, because um, today Putin sees Ukraine as crucial for his rebuilding of a new union. Mm -hmm. You can't have um, a, a Ruski Mir, a Russian world. And you can't have a Eurasian Economic Union without Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So the same uh, uh, kind of psychological impact as in 1991 is there today. Um, in the Soviet Union, the three Eastern Slavic people, Russian, Ukrainians and Belarusians, were the, the, the core mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union. And when they met in uh, Belovetska Pusha, 7th, 8th of December 1991, they only met themselves. They then told the other republics the Soviet Union is over. Okay. So the other republics were less important. And it's the same here today. Today, the Ruski Mir, the three Eastern Slavic people, Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians, would be the core of Putin's new Eurasian Union. Yeah. So it's the same mentality as this. Um, in the late 1980s, uh, the, uh, I, was, uh, I tried to travel to the Soviet Union for the first time. In, in April or March, April, I don't remember, 1990. And I was sent back from Sheremetyev. I was not let into the Soviet Union. I was sent mm -hmm. back from Sheremetyev Airport in Moscow, back to Warsaw, where I came from. I, I was on a blacklist. So I was on a blacklist uh, twice in my life, um, once by the KGB in uh, 1990 and once during the Euromaidan when they published this list of blacklisted Westerners. Um, which included Saakashvili, lots of Georgians, oh. and, and myself. You. And myself, okay. yes. It didn't work because I still traveled to Ukraine in December, nine, uh, December 2013. Um, I think there was just chaos then sure. in the SBU. Um, so the first time I traveled to the Soviet Union was in, in September 1991, after the coup, after the failed coup, because by then the KGB was finished as a structure. After, after the failure of that hardline mm -hmm. uh, coup. Before we continue to the 90s, there was a crucial moment when meeting in Belovarska Pushcha, collapse Soviet <laughs> Union. Like, how did you anticipate that event? You know, because it was a transition <laughs> of uh, collapse of Soviet Union. People were doing mm -hmm. these referendums first before declaring independence. And then like new sovereign states pop right. up. Right uh, on the graves of the former like Soviet Empire. Like how? What was your approach? How did you feel? Like how can you describe these uh, events? There? It's an interesting question, mm -hmm. and uh, and you will see how it's interesting because um, when Ukraine declared independence and in on the twenty fourth of August nineteen ninety one, it was a Saturday. I remember, and 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 I was with a friend in a pub. There was no, this is, you know, no mobile phones, no, you know, British no, pub. Uh, yeah, British yeah. pub. There's no mobile phones. There's no way of my wife telling me this is, this has happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was having a drink at lunchtime with a friend, came home about four o'clock in the afternoon. And my wife said, do you realize what's happened? Ukraine's declared independence because Kiev is two hours ahead, right, of, of, of England. And so I said, wow. So I had spent the whole evening on TV and radio after this. Yeah. The problem there was many Ukrainians, particularly dissidents like Yachislav Chornovil and writers like Ivan Drach, 
they were afraid that there wouldn't be enough support for the referendum. Um, and um, because the West, then Western governments demanded that the referendum result be not 50%, but two thirds okay. minimum. Um, and so many were worried, you know, in East and Southern Ukraine, would they support independence? And this is where we have to credit Lenin Krauchuk, mm -hmm. because he organized his former communist apparat, um, you know, this network, his apparatus, nomenklatura, uh, in those regions to, to support the referendum. And, and this is what happened. And then we got the surprise, I think for many people, surprise result of 92% support, including in Donbass and Crimea. Even in Crimea, there yes. was a majority. Majority everywhere. In every region of Ukraine was a majority. Um, this completely was a surprise to Russians. I remember people like Boris Yeltsin say, Что? Тоже в Донбассе? Also in Donbass, also in Crimea. Ukrainians have become citizens over these 30 years of independence. You had three revolutions, yeah. we forget. Not two, three, because you had a revolution in 1990, the Granite Revolution, mm -hmm. then 2004, and then 2014, where Ukrainians had become citizens. So it was like, when I look back, basically, I witnessed this in tech. I grew up together with Ukraine. I was born a few years. You plus many millions of other people. Exactly. And, yeah. and, and, you, and you, some of you came in 2004 to the Orange Revolution, but millions of you came in 2014. Exactly. So, you know, because by 2014, I mean, you had, you know, you had how many generations had grown up in a dependent yeah. Ukraine and you had East Ukrainians who were mm. patriotic. I mean, let's remember that Yanukovych ran away from Kiev to Kharkiv, where he tried to, the, the idea was yeah. to create a Congress to have a separatist East Ukraine and the Congress failed. Why? Because local patriots, young people, um, stopped it. Um, and and they they created the famous song, Putin Huilo song, the Putin dickhead song. Putin Huilo! That was created by people from Kharkiv, uh, not, not Tunisians, Kharkiv. We had a little viewer to polite. <laughs> I think I think the difference is very simple. It's not so much politeness as to do with that. If you live in the V, if you simply have no problem with your language, you know, no, nobody's going to punch you in the face or beat you up if you speak Ukrainian. Yeah. Try this in Kharkiv. Yeah. Try this in Donetsk. Try this in Odessa or the Crimea. I remember Crimea in 1992. They refused to sell me a train ticket when I spoke Ukrainian. Okay. The language question should be understood as part of a pro broader. Um, transformation, which is revolutionary. We should not be surprised. In every uh, occasion in, in European world history, when you have war, when you have bloodshed, when you have conflict, identities change very quickly. You can look at these last 30 years and say, well, we, we've had an evolutionary uh, transformation of Ukrainian identity since 1991 until 2013. And then a revolutionary change in identity from 2014, and then from 2022, a super revolutionary. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's completely, completely different. In 2014, what you had was, um, and the most important changes are always going to be not West Ukraine, but Eastern and Southern Ukraine. Yeah. West Ukrainians didn't have to change their attitudes. They were always kind of like in the Baltic states or Poland, anti-Russian and anti-Moscow. What you, what, where the biggest impact of these changes were amongst Russian speakers and amongst Eastern and Southern Ukrainians. Um, and in, and in, when you have a war, when you have bloodshed, um, you cannot sit on the fence. You have to decide, are you for this side, or are mm. you for that side? Um, and that includes many people with mixed marriages, um, because there were people in Eastern Ukraine who had mixed parents, father, uh, you know, mother and father, Ukrainian, Russian, um, or they even, some of them, some people even said, I'm Russian, Ukrainian, they were mixed. You can no longer do this when you have a conflict. You have to decide. Now, Putin expected um, that 90% majority of Russian speakers would be pro Putin, pro-Russian, pro-Russian mm -hmm. world. That did not happen. A majority of Ru Ukraine's Russian speakers in 2014 supported Ukraine. So their Ukrainian identity, whether it's civic identity or whether it's civic ethno-cultural, it can be either, um, was greater 
than the than an identity which gave you an allegiance to the Ruski Mir, to the Russian world, or to to Moscow. Mm -hmm. um, the only places in in the east and south where before 2014 you had kind of relatively high levels of support for separatism were Crimea, where it was about 40 percent, and Donbass were about 30 percent. Mm -hmm. Never a majority in either place. So in, in both regions, Crimea and Donbass, you still needed the Russian army to help the separatists, mm -hmm. for them to come to power. And a weak, maybe, government in Kiev. Um, but elsewhere in the east and south, um, it was different. And I think the problem that Western experts, so-called, had is that they assume the east Ukraine is all the same. Yeah. And they assume west Ukraine is all the same. And they obviously don't even know West Ukraine because, I mean, for example, you compare Lviv and, and Transcarpathia, they are totally mm -hmm. different. In 2010, actually, Transcarpathia voted, was the only region of West Ukraine which voted for Yanukovych. True. Um, so, because yeah. of the Beloga clan. Um, so, and East Ukraine was also different. You had, um, if you want to call it the hard core, if in West Ukraine you have seven regions. Okay. Three regions are Galicia, they are the hard core. In, in East Ukraine, the hardcore is Donbass, Donetsk, Luhansk. But other regions are different. You know, mm -hmm. Kharkiv is different, as we can see, which is fighting against Russia now. Odessa is different. Dnipropetrovsk is totally different. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, so I, I think that was a misnomer that somehow the East and South was all the same. But it's been, a, I think, a problem to this day that both in Moscow and so-called Western experts do not understand the concept of Russian-speaking Ukrainian patriotism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I always like people tell if they speak Russian, they probably want to join Russia. But mm -hmm. it's possible to tell, okay, like so. Let's uh, think that um, Spanish-speaking Texas people want somehow to join Mexico, for example. No, right? they run no. away from Mexico. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but but it's also even more ridiculous. I mean, I lived uh -huh. in Canada 15 years. So, so are you trying to tell me English-speaking Canadians are Americans? No, they're different. They're mm -hmm. Canadians. Mm -hmm. So. So, I mean, a, a majority of people in Ireland, they learn Irish Gaelic, Gaelic in school, but they speak English, most, mm -hmm. uh, most, uh, are most people in Ireland. And so the, the idea that, that, that um, if you're Russian speaking, you have to be pro-Kremlin was, was a mistake for Western so-called experts and in Moscow. Now, I think in the West, they have changed their, they're slowly changing their views. In Moscow, they cannot simply to this day understand this mm -hmm. question. So in 2014, you already had a change. And I think a big change was attitudes towards Russia. Um, but in 2014, what you had was majority of Ukrainians uh, became very negative towards Russian leaders. Mm -hmm. So 80% uh, of Ukrainians uh, were negative towards Putin, uh, Russian government, the Russian so-called parliament, State Duma. Um, but they were not uh, negative towards the Russian people. Mm -hmm. In 2022, that completely changed. So in 2022, with mm -hmm. the invasion, Ukraines became negative towards everybody in Russia. Yeah. The population and Russian leaders. And the reasons for that are relatively simple to understand. Um, Russian people supported the war. Um, Russian people have not really opposed the war. They, they, they make excuses that they cannot go on the streets, they will be arrested. Well, I'm sorry, in Iran, they go on the streets, and mm. the Iranian regime is far worse than the Russian. In Iran, they execute you for being in the opposition. In Russia, you just go to jail. Yeah. So this is just because you are a coward or you are supporting the war. Majority of Russians, uh, sorry, a large number of Russians left Russia at when mobilization began in the autumn of 2022. But most of those are not anti-Putin. They just did not want to die mm -hmm. in the war. And I have friends in Georgia now who were telling me that the Russians who are living in Georgia, the new Russians who have just come, um, they are hostile to the protests. Oh, wow. That can be... They are hostile to the protests because the protests are pro-Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And these Russians do not like uh, these protests. Yeah. Um, and they actually... So these so-called people who fled, they're not supporters of the opposition from Russia. They just don't want to die in a war. Uh, uh, that, that's, they're basically, you know, cowards Instinct in that sense. Yeah, yeah, but they're not anti-Putin and they're not critical. So if you use the argument, I cannot protest in Russia because the regime is too tough. 
Okay, well, now you live in Armenia and Georgia. These are democratic countries. Why are you not protesting there? You're not. You're not mm, protesting exactly. because you're because you basically and everywhere support the around war. the world. As yes, well. yes. Yeah. You're basically supporting the war, or you are indifferent. So and and when you when genocide is committed, you cannot be indifferent. Indifference means you are supporting genocide. Yeah. Um, and so I think Ukrainians understand this perfectly, and hence why this. Um, in recent opinion polls, less than 5% of Ukrainians have a positive view of Russia and Russians. I must tell less you... Less than 5%. I mean, that's yeah. revolutionary. So just to quickly mm -hmm. finish this, yeah, yeah. on the language question, it's not surprising because what you have... In 2014, you have this change, this kind of radical changes, but in 2022, you have a radical, a revolutionary transformation of Ukrainian identity across everything. To attitudes to history, language, culture, uh, attitudes to Russia and Russians. Everything now changes and um, Putin has made Ukrainian nationalists into East Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. um, East Ukrainians now have the same views on Russia, on Ukraine history, on Ukraine language, on Ukraine culture as West Ukrainians. So over 30 years we have seen the West Ukrainian position become the East Ukrainian position thanks to Russian genocide and military invasion. Thanks for those clarifications. And actually, guys, if you take a look closer on things that we talked about here, and if you like get more familiar with the Ukrainian modern history, you'll see that that was a kind of organic, painful process. Evolutionary and revolutionary together. Yeah. I mean, you have both mm -hmm. taking place. I think you could kind of look at it like evolutionary until 2013, with important breaks like mm. Orange Revolution, Euromaidan, and then revolutionary from 2014, and then 2022, it just becomes super revolutionary. Exactly. It just so. becomes, it's basically identity changing on steroids. So um, in 2014-15, the Ukrainian government introduced decommunization. In 2022, Ukrainian government is not introducing derussification. This is done by Ukrainians themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is from the bottom up yeah. that Ukrainians are getting rid of Russian monuments um, and monuments to Soviet history, um, which were kept before, and they're changing street names and everything. So that derussification is, is part of this general process of reaction. And, you know, in, in times of a war, people have to do things differently in mm. the way they respond to the war. Some people join the army, some people join territorial defense, some people become partisans, some people become bloggers, some people become volunteers in civil society. Other people think they can't do all of those things, they do other things. Some people protest by changing their language uh, state, you know, they go from Russian to Ukrainian, which is a, a process. You can't just become a Ukrainian speaker overnight. Um, some people um, do other ways of changing their identity. So um, you protest against the war in different ways. And one of the ways you protest is by saying, for me, from now, the Russian language is the language of genocide. Yeah. It's the language of the military aggressor. And therefore, I am no longer going to speak this language. And that only, not only affects the language, it also affects people who, who, are, who are part of that Russian language culture. So Pushkin. Tolstoy and you know these Russian writers like Pushkin were supporters of Russian imperialism mm -hmm. um, so you know when we are shocked by this well let's remember that this is not again not that unusual you know the Irish did this the same to English writers if you're an English writer and you supported colonialism against Ireland you're not exactly going to be popular in Ireland mm -hmm. and it's the same in Ukraine so um, Basically, so, we reach the point when there is no return, there's no when return, all no. the chains are cut, and when no Ukraine return. is as the one big train, all connected together, goes to the West. Yeah, and yeah, it's national integration yeah. now is completely mm -hmm. united. Um, there is, you can't, this is not like a video recorder where you press return, you know, um, rewind. You can't rewind this. Once an identity has changed, especially when this is not just an invasion, this is genocide. Um, you, you know, you war crimes, looting, mm -hmm. raping, raping of, of females from the age of four to 82. This is what the United Nations report described, from the age of four to 82. I mean, this is still the Soviet Union of Second World War. Mm -hmm. 
This is still the Soviet army. Nothing's changed in Russia um, under this. And so you cannot change that. And the Ukrainian opinion polls show how uh, Ukrainians say there will be no improvement relations with Russia for decades. Uh Um, It also has shown that um, now, for the first time ever, you have majority support, 60-70% support for NATO and EU membership in eastern Ukraine. Yeah. So again, that that's completely shown. So there is zero support for pro pro Russianism is dead in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, Twelve pro Russian parties are banned, and they will never come back. And the Russian Orthodox Church is is de facto dead. And um, even if there were some pro Russian people, they probably already left Ukraine. They probably already yeah. left because they collaborated, and then um, and oh, they they're too scared to to say anything. Um, and and you 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 cannot. I mean, I when I was in. Ukraine in, in, in June, June of last year, um, in t- 2022, I, I interviewed Yuri Boyko from the opposition platform, mm-hmm. the former pro-Russian party. And, you know, he's no longer pro-Russian. They're a pro- Really? Even uh, Boyko not pro-Russian? No, not now, no. Wow. I mean, you cannot... How can you... If you are still pro-Russian, as you said, what you have fled to Russia. Yeah. Because you cannot stay in Ukraine and defend what Russia is doing. No. I mean, you know... I mean, the invasion is one thing, but just everything else, war crimes and genocide. I mean, you cannot defend this. I mean, how? How do you defend this? Uh, I mean, and, and this is not, and, you know, for Yuri Boyko, this is not done against West Ukrainians. Mm. It's done against his voters. Yeah. The Donbass is completely destroyed by Putin, not by Ukraine's genocide, by Putin's army. Prior to 2014, the population of the Donbass was the highest in in ukraine it was the, mo- the very urban most area most, area most urban area. area it was six million people yeah. two oblasts two regions today and um, which was about six million today it's about f- um one point four point eight million have gone either uh, have fled to other parts of ukraine or some to russia and they've been killed it's probably even hard to calculate uh, i myself spent a fair amount of time in the frontline areas and i have guys on this channel a few videos from Donbass. So if you're curious just to see what's the life like there and to at least somehow understand the scale of destruction, mm-hmm. which is horrifying, please welcome to, mm-hmm. to watch those it's other the, videos. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, just look at Bakhmut and these cities. I mean, mm. R- Russia doesn't care about maintaining yeah. this population or maintaining these urban centers. It just wants to capture land exactly. and destroy Ukraine. So um, I think that... Um, I think an important, a very important um, uh, change is, of course, religion. And um, the, for Russia, the big shock was Ukraine receiving autocephaly, independence, in, in, in effect, from, from the Russian Orthodox Church in 2018, 2019. And this was so much of a shock for Russia that Putin called an emergency meeting of the Russian Security Council. The Russian Orthodox Church is the only church in, uh, Orthodox Church in the world which is not a national church. Most Orthodox churches are Orthodox, you know, of a national state. Mm-hmm. So like Bulgarian, Serbian, Greek, whatever. The Russian Orthodox Church claims itself to be a, a church for the Eastern Slavic people. So for the so-called Ruski Mir or in or Obshi Ruski Narod, the pan-Russian nation. So great little and white Russians. And so the shock of Constantinople telling um, the Russian Orthodox Church that Ukraine is not your canonical territory was just shock, you know, a major mm-hmm. earthquake for the Russian Orthodox Church. And uh, we should remember that Ukraine is about 40% of Russian Orthodox parishes. So um, without Ukraine, the Russian Orthodox Church is no longer the biggest Orthodox Church in the world. Hmm. Now it's Romania. Romania, Romania is, f- is first okay. place. Russian Orthodox Church is lower down. Russians are not as religious as Ukrainians. Mm-hmm. They don't go to church as much as Ukrainians. So that was a major, uh, I think, loss. And now, because the Russian Orthodox Church has supported, well, the Russian Orthodox Church Patriarch Kirill has supported the genocide war against mm-hmm. Ukraine, the Russian Orthodox Church has completely lost its support. Plus, in occupied areas, the Russian Orthodox Church has collaborated with Russian troops. So today, uh, something like only 4% of Ukrainians, according to a poll, opinion poll, actually say they belong to the Russian Orthodox mm-hmm. Church. 4%. So uh, many ties between Ukraine and Russia that were supposed to be gained with the centuries forever, forever. are gone forever. They're gone. Yeah. They're gone. 
they were slowly being broken until 2013. Mm -hmm. Yushchenko began this after the Orange Revolution. And then after 2014, they began to be broken even more by Poroshenko with things like um, decommunization mm -hmm. laws and also with, with banning TV broadcasts from Russia, uh, social media. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Ukrainians, sw prior to 2014, most Ukrainians used the contact you. Mm -hmm. Since 2014, everybody switched to Facebook. Uh, Facebook. Yep. Prior to 2014, most Ukrainians used the Russian email. Mail.ru. Mail.ru, Mail yes. Now they use Gmail. Yeah. So all of this changed since after 2014 and after 2022, now this it became steroids. It's steroids. tsunami. Tsunami. Exactly. It's a tsunami. Absolutely right. And, um, and that cannot be changed. It cannot be taken back. Too many people have suffered. Oh. Too many people have died. Um, and, you know, it's not just Bucha. I mean, Mariupol. It was a city of 400,000, 450,000 people, 100,000 had been murdered. And this was Russian speakers. Yeah. This was a city that voted for the opposition bloc, yeah. not for nationalist parties, for Akhmetov's um, opposition bloc. So I think uh, Ukraine has changed. And one of the fathers, um, the fathers of Ukrainian nationhood will be Khrushchevsky, Kravchuk, Petlura, Bandera and Putin. And Putin. and Putin. Yeah, that's true. Because some people tell that no one united Ukrainians that effectively as the Putin did. Guys, by the way, also one of the previous videos on this channel is related to UPA and Volin topics, where I'm discussing those sensitive things with my Polish friend. So it's very interesting how they react on this. But guys, that's another story. Uh, Taras, it's an amazing discussion. I'm very fascinated mm -hmm. with uh, your angle of view and your depth, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, I will provide links to a few publications next mm -hmm. to this video. So I invite you guys to uh, research more and study more the work of Taras. But by this moment, everyone who's watching the video is probably wondering, like, what's, what's that on the table appeared just next to you? Well, the most, <laughs> the most important thing is not the book, it's the beer. I okay. mean, this is Putin. This is a beer named after the famous Kharkiv Ultras, the football fans who... Um, and it's written here. Yes. yes. Putin Hulo. Putin Dickhead. Dickhead. Uh, yes. You can buy this beer in a, a beer uh, shop in Lviv, Pravda, yes. right? The truth. Yes. yes. So. For me, what's interesting about the origins of this slogan is that, again, it undermines this image of, of Ukraine that the crazy guys or the most radical guys are West Ukrainians. No. The most radical nationalists in Ukraine are Eastern Ukrainians, like the people who coined this phrase Putin Hulo and then joined the Azov Battalion. The Azov Battalion are mainly Russian speakers from Eastern mm -hmm. Ukraine. The, you know, the idea we should change our image of Ukraine to understand that um, the country is a very, it's not a simple East-West split. It's a very, you know, mixed picture. And... Um, the reason for this is that West, in Western Ukraine, the national question, if you want to call it that, was kind of resolved mm. by the 1940s because the, Stalin organized a population exchange. Western Ukraine became ethnically homogenous. Ukrainians were sent from Poland to West Ukraine and Poles were sent from West Ukraine to Poland. That's actually a story of my family. I, I am Lemko. I am half Lemko mm -hmm. and half a Ukrainian from uh, Natsanya, from, from another territory which is currently in Poland. So yeah, yeah. I mean, this happened. Four of my from, grandparents moved. From mm -hmm. 1944 to 46, this is what yeah, they did, yeah, yeah. Uh, this transfer of population. Stalin, therefore, created an ethnically homogenous West Ukraine. So, again, we should understand that they were extreme forms of chauvinism and nationalism, which were not Ukrainian, which were pro-Russian as well in Ukraine. And this was supported by Putin um, in places like Crimea and the East. And these Azov guys were, were super patriots and, um, and they have continued. There was a, um, an actual I like funeral a few mm. days ago of Da Vinci, one of the, yeah. one of the f fighters of, the, of, of this Azov group. Um, this is our new book, um, mm -hmm. just, just published a month ago. Uh, the title is self-evident, Fascism and Genocide. Um, I think there's simply no question the fascists are not the Ukrainians, the fascists are the Russians. Everything they are doing is, a, is from Hitler's uh, and Stalin's playbook um, in Ukraine. 
This is the Soviet army which, which raped and looted throughout mm. Eastern Europe and Germany in World War II is the same Soviet army which is now doing this in Ukraine. Um, we talk about um, also we praise the, the volunteers in Ukraine. I think this is one of the amazing factors of this war is how this is a war between both a NATO trained army and an old Soviet army. So a 21st century army, Ukrainian, and a, and a 20th century Russian army. That's why the Russian army has been defeated. Mm -hmm. And also between a Russian society, which is, which is a society of slaves, society built on a vertical. So this is a vertically constructed mm -hmm. Russian society fighting against a horizontally based Ukrainian society. Ukrainian is horizontal. It's a society which is composed of volunteer, a massive volunteer movement of from children to old age pensioners, every generation, um, civil society, where people feel they have agency. And this people is feel they can change things. Yes. And this is one of the biggest differences that about yes. this vertical and horizontal yes, explanation. Yes. It's a vertical yeah. versus a horizontal yeah. society. Russians um, have not been allowed um, uh, to become citizens. They have remained subjects. They have remained slaves. And they don't feel they have agency. They don't feel they can change anything. Mm. Um, Ukrainians do. They, feel, they all feel they have power. They're, so they don't wait. They don't appeal. So when you see videos of Russian soldiers complaining about how they are badly equipped, what do they do? Like in Tsarist and Soviet times, they send an appeal to the big Tsar, yeah, to yeah. Putin. They have faith in the good Tsar. The good faith yeah, in the good Tsar. Yeah. Ukrainians don't, don't have a faith mm -hmm. in the good Tsar. They do things themselves. Exactly. So they act themselves. And so this massive volunteer movement, which I saw when I traveled around eastern and southern Ukraine after 2014, is now even bigger. And... And it's a national phenomena and it's often dominated by women. Yeah. And what, um, what in history, we see this in the 20th century, wars always empower women. Mm -hmm. um, because women, for example, got the vote um, in Western Europe after eight, 1918 and after 1945. Wars and conflict empower women because the men are fighting and the women have to take over the factories. Yeah, they have yeah. to work in the factories and they have to provide at the, at the home front, as it were, because in those days women did not join the army. Today, Ukrainian army has one of the highest proportions in the world of women in the army. One of the highest. The proportion of women in the Ukrainian army is higher than in Great Britain and in the United States. So that plus women in volunteer movement um, is, is huge. Uh, on all fronts, the terit and on territorial all, defense. On well. all fronts, our society proved the resilience. It showed resilience, the example, yes. and Ukrainians now are uh, like an equivalent of of courage and and uh, freedom and Western values. Led guys. by yeah. somebody who can be certainly defined yeah. as Winston Churchill of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. Exactly. We should not forget this: that he, mm. many of us, including myself had very many doubts mm -hmm. about Zelensky. I didn't uh, vote for Zelensky, I actually. Didn't, yeah. I didn't support him in 2019 mm -hmm. as well. What a uh, turn it is. Um, yep. And opinion polls prior to the war, prior to the invasion, showed that many Ukrainians doubted whether Zelensky could be a good commander-in-chief. We were all proven wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one of the reasons for this is that not only is he um, a self-made man, he's not a product of the 1990s yeah. wild capitalism, so he, there's nobody's ever shown that he's got corruption background. Uh, but secondly, I think importantly, he's got Jewish background, which also shows that um, he has a strong sense of injustice. And this war is unjust. Mm -hmm. Ukraine did not mm -hmm. ask for this war. Ukraine did not threaten Russia. That's a, a ridiculous joke. Um, Ukraine was not threatening to invade Russia. So this war is completely unjust from all sorts of angles. And I think Zelensky feels that. And you look on his face when he visited Butcher. Yeah. For him, this is the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, and let's remember his background. His background was that he's the, the son of a, of a grandfather who was, um, uh, who was only alive because he was in the Soviet army fighting the Nazis. All the rest of his grandfather's family was murdered by the Nazis in the Holocaust. Yeah. 
So if, if, if his grandfather had not been in the Soviet army, if he had been at home, he would have been killed as well. Mm -hmm. Zelensky would not have been born. So Zelensky has this background, um, which I think uh, provides that kind of, um, you know, human sense that what is happening is unjust. And, and I think his um, strong sense of um, identity mm. and, and Ukrainianness um, has been proven when he refused to flee. So the, exactly. the Russians made two, and I'll finish on this question, the Russians mm. made two major miscalculations. Um, Ru because Russian uh, imperial nationalists never understood and still do not understand Ukraine, they assumed there is no Ukraine, there are no Ukrainians. They they really did truly believe that these little Russians would greet them with, with bread and salt and flowers. They were completely, obviously, mistaken about this question. And they thought that Zelensky was a clown and he would run away with, you know, stolen money. Um, this Again, they were completely wrong about this. Um, the second miscalculation was the Russians believed that the West would be a very weak response and very divided response. Now, here, I think the Russians had a kind of a some degree a right to believe this because until then the western response had been pathetic towards russian aggression um, in 2008 russia invaded georgia there were no mm -hmm. sanctions in 2014 the uh, crimea. russia annexed crimea invaded ukraine and the sanctions were pathetic they were they were they were nothing and the west continued to do business with russia Nord stream 2 continued to be built so russia thought that it was going to invade, the West would go again like this, you know, you naughty boy, but let's <laughs> continue to have yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. They were wrong. So, so Russia crossed the red line and then, it, and, and you know, so not only did Putin's invasion um, help to build a united Ukraine, it built a united European Union and united NATO. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To me, the story of Ukraine is, a, is like a, a movie that nobody like could predict like any other things you know guys no, no, and no, no. Uh, please continue staying with ukraine continue being aware uh, i hope our uh, interview was a good introduction to your book uh, the book by taras kuzio is called fascism and genocide russia's war against ukrainians guys you can learn much more in depth uh, from this publication and also you publish so many other books right mm -hmm. Uh, so please, uh, links will be provided below this video, guys. And thanks for, for watching. If you have any ideas or you want to comment something was, which was mentioned here, feel free to do so in the comments below. And let's continue our discussion uh, until the victory of Ukraine. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Slava Ukraini. Heroem Slava.